So this here is a tenon, uh, something you would be very familiar with if you're a woodworker. If not, um, basically, this is the male to a mortise, which is the female, and it's a good way to connect um, joinery. Uh, cutting these can be time consuming. Uh, there's lots of different jigs and methods to do it. You can use a dado stack, you can cut it by hand, you can, there's a table saw jigs and stuff like that. Um, in Japan, I fell in love with a similar version to this tool, which is tenon cutter. And usually this is the other side of a shaft for a rip table saw. So there'll be one motor with a pulley in the middle and it, you rip your wood on one side and you can cut your tenons on the other side. I would have loved to bring one of these back, um, but they are very heavy and I was already spending a lot of money shipping some other equipment back. So I decided I could build one because I had uh, a friend of mine had given me this XY table and that, that's one of the things that you need to make this tenon cutter adjustable is you need the ability to raise this table um, and move it side to side. So I figured I could adapt this XY table and put a saw blade on a shaft, spin it with a motor, and now I have myself a tenon cutter. So at a high level, what happens is you got a two horsepower, nice ball door motor, 3,500 RPM, 3,400 RPM, one-to-one -one pulley. That spins the shaft on two uh, ball bearing blocks. And this spins and you feed your material in here. And what you've, you've already cut these shoulders on something like a sliding table saw. And I have a video where I built a cool sliding table saw sled. Um, and the saw comes in and cuts the, the cheek of the tenon. And what's really cool is because the saw is a, uh, is a circle, obviously, you can undercut the tenon a little bit, which will prevent it from not seating all the way. And also when you have very small tenons, uh, it leaves only a little bit of wood on the edge, which can compress and make nice for nice tight joinery. Um, you have three different axes, uh, three different degrees of freedom here. You have, uh, we could call it the, uh, the X, which is this hand, hand wheel here. Uh, and that adjusts the distance between the fence and the cheek of the tenon, which you can do a direct measurement off of here. Then you have the Z, which is the height, and that is this one down here. And that one, you actually want to divide the, uh, the thickness of your material by, by two, which will get your center line of the material in the center line of the blade and have a perfect semicircular uh, uh, cut when it goes into the the shoulder of the tenon. Uh, I would have. They do sell measuring tapes that um that do the division for you, but I think it was only in standard, and I wanted this to be metric. Um, and then your final adjustment is the we could call it the Y or the depth. That is this little adjustment rod here which you can slide in and out and lock it in place. And that is a stop so that you only feed your workpiece in so far and the blade impacts the shoulder just enough, just kisses the shoulder. You can kind of see where it kissed the shoulder there. That ensures you get a full cut. Um, 220 volts, two horsepower motor, a uh, little on off switch. Uh, it's a steel tube frame. I machined the shaft, uh, some modifications to the, the XY sled and I made this steel fence. So it's a very heavy thing. It weighs about 120 something pounds. It doesn't move around. It's very stable. 
and there's sort of a dust collection option here. Uh, in testing, it actually sucked the little pieces next to that screen in there. I was hoping to let the pieces fall through and have the dust get sucked in. Uh, so I might have to partially close a wastegate. Um, so yeah, so let's, uh, let's build this bad boy and see how it works. All right, I wanna begin by taking a step back and kind of explaining how I even went about designing this machine. Because um, even sort of for me who knows what I wanna build, it's a bit overwhelming to have such a complicated machine with lots of parts and, and constraints. And um, as part of this series on the tenon cutter, I think it'd be helpful to kind of teach how I approach a problem like this so that you could apply something like that to a project or a machine that you want to build. Um, so it really comes down to just uh, figuring out what are the requirements of the machine and what has to be one way or another and what is variable. So your constraints and your degrees of freedom. And if you start with what is most constrained, you can kind of work out from there to determine, you know, the next part location or the next required part or the next size of part. And you kind of build from this core of constraints to create more constraints and then sort of the engineering comes in as a uh, as the compromises to meet each problem that you discover. So let's kind of start with a high level overview of what this tenon cutter does. Uh, for one thing, there's a blade. There's this circular 10 inch blade, so that's a constraint. 10 inch size, uh, I believe it's about eight eight inch or or eight, eighth inch or three millimeters thick. So that that's sort of our first constraint. That's fixed in space. That's a spinning blade. It has to spin in somewhere. So we'll just say that's the beginning. And then the other requirement for the tenon cutter is that you're able to adjust a fence left and right relative to the blade and up and down relative to the blade center. So I wanted to make sure that the bottom of the fence uh, table, I guess you could call it, is at the exact center line of the blade. And that at a certain point, sort of the default, the side of the fence is exactly in line with one edge of the blade. So as you move the uh, fence over, it takes off a certain amount of material. Uh, so that kind of determines the f the relative location of this in space to the blade. And then as far as the uh, distance between the blade and the fence, I just kind of arbitrarily decided a small amount. I didn't want it too close, but, uh, you know, not I didn't want it touching the blade, but I didn't want it so far back that the fibers might chip out on the back of the workpiece. Okay, so um, now to control this table, uh, I had the um, this XY table that I, I was given. So there's a lot already done with this table. Um, I modeled the uh, you know the table fairly well. I measured. Uh, the existing structure and, and brought it into the CAD. Um, but the the basic idea is that I established a position of the table in terms of its height along this axis and its left-right motion along this axis so that when I adjusted it, this table would move where I wanted it to. So this is fairly moved to the left and when I spin the hand wheels it'll move the table to the right. Similarly, this is fairly high up, which gets the center line of the blade with the table, and then when I turn the hand wheels on the bottom, it'll pull it down, which uh, moves the, the, the tip of this arc 
to the center of whatever thickness workpiece, which will make more sense when we see it in operation. Um, so that's another kind of arbitrary decision. I, I didn't. I wanted to give myself a little leeway on one side, and then, you know, some amount of flexibility in there. Um, and sort of once this was located in space, I was able to design this um, L bracket part to connect the fixed location of the table and fence to where what used to be a jar jaw of the vise on the cross slide table. Um, and that that gets back to another part of my sort of design design philosophy on on building these types of things is you kind of want to model everything as accurately as possible um, because you're going to end up placing all these parts, whether you purchase the parts or you make the parts, in space uh, relative to other, other parts. And I find it's very helpful um, to iterate through sort of design decisions when you can move a very accurate representation of a purchased part in space. So, you know, I, I started basically with modeling my blade, uh, modeling the cross slide, other parts that I was able to download from McMaster where I was going to order them, uh, modeled the motor, uh, the pulleys, pretty much pretty much anything that I was going to buy, I, I made sure there was a representation in CAD, then I could design parts around those, those 3D models basically. Uh, okay, so continuing on. Uh, once the uh, cross slide table was in place, you know, you could add in handles. Um, and then there were sub assemblies or sub processes related to the cross slide table that I kind of dealt with outside of the main machine construction. For example, I had to modify the shafts. Uh, for keyways to put these handles on and I machined down a little bit of the table to install these little um, sight gauges for measuring tapes so you can sort of break off sub assemblies of your main machine where the little details you want don't really impact the the placement of these parts in space okay so now we have the we have the cross slide we have the blade we have the fence we have the table uh, this blade needs to be spun by something, so we're going to need a shaft, right? Okay, so the shaft exists now, and uh, there was also two other parts that I modeled, uh, which were these, I think they were from, I think they were unused from my bench grinder, these, uh, these little stabilizer pieces, and uh, then there's also a nut. So, on this side, the blade basically determined the constraints of the shaft on this side. I, I had a 5 8 inch hole in the blade, which is common to blades in the US. Uh, I needed to do, hold the thickness of the blade plus the thickness of these two spacer pieces and have enough room to thread the nut on. And I was going to use a fine thread uh, to for like a nice high quality tight nut here. And then I also wanted to make sure I had flats so that I could wrench down on the shaft. And another determination was I wanted to use a one inch thick shaft so I could have fairly substantial bearings and a, a lot of uh, solid mass in the shaft so that I didn't have any kind of strange vibrations because there was fairly large amount of distance between the bearing that's going to support the shaft here and the where the, the spinning mass is because there needs to be clearance between the the fence and the bearing so as not to uh, run into it. Um, and so there's there's the next constraint. Where does the first bearing go? So it's going to be somewhere uh, somewhere here so that when this is moved over to the left as much as possible it doesn't get into the bearing. So we can add in the bearing. So there's that bearing. You see. And then we have another bearing and a pulley. So how long was the shaft going to be? Well, this gets into sort of a packaging concept. Like the shaft could be very long, the shaft could be attached to something else, but I'm thinking like, okay, how 
compact and dense can I make this machine so that it doesn't fall over and I don't have, it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I can orient the motor behind the this assembly and sort of somewhat farther back and have the motor kind of inside the machine. So we add in a motor. Um, and it's associated bully. And you can see now like the motor takes up a lot of space inside this machine and basically how far I wanted the motor to go in the left direction would determine how long the shaft would be. And you also have to consider there's certain cut lengths of this precision shaft material. So you end up kind of taking a bunch of variables into your, into account and making compromises as to how big this is going to be. I used the, the shaft length and having enough clearance behind the, uh, having enough clearance for the motor to figure out how long the shaft was, which, and I placed the bearing fairly close to the end, and the features of the shaft were designed to fit uh, the pulley. The size of pulley was determined uh, by the belt I was going to run, which had to support a certain amount of horsepower and a certain amount of speed. And then the vertical position of the motor was determined by the standard sizes of belts. I could have had this motor much lower down or slightly higher up, and it would have been a different size of belt. And fortunately, Inventor allows uh, has a nice little belt design tool that makes it kind of easy to figure out where this is going to be. So what I actually end up doing is figuring out approximately where the motor was going to be, then using the belt tool to find out exactly where the pulley had to be, and then I added in the uh, the motor. So there's the belt, and we're starting to see a lot of the parts in space here. All right, so then I needed a way to attention the motor, so we add in a adjustable motor mount, and that the motor bolts onto that, and this is about midway between its adjustment range, so we can loosen this to add the belt on, and then crank this bolt down to tighten up. And then I needed a way to stop the workpiece, so there's a rod that gonna that fits in here. And this was determined by length to move it in and out, and also when it rotates around its position, I didn't want this to hit the blade. I wanted to basically be able to get the tip of this fairly in close to this corner to stop the workpiece, but not too close. And when this rod was, um, once this rod was determined, the next step was to build a little block to hold it. All right, so that that was a matter of determining. Okay, I need. I wanted to have a little block of aluminum with two bolts to hold it to the cast iron cross slide, and then a little uh, adjustment screw to tighten it in. Um, so that was a fairly easy design element. And once I knew the position of the rod and the position of this block, I could transfer those features uh, to the cross slide. So when I modified those parts, uh, you know, I had I had the dimensions I need. This is basically the whole machine now, right? It's kind of just floating in space, but all the main constraints are locked down. Um, but, you know, in reality, you can't just float parts in space and lock them and have them work. We need a frame for that. Uh, but the ultimate guiding principle to this frame, oops, which looks rather complicated, is I'm just... I'm just connecting the dots basically with the mounting points that I've defined by constraining all the uh, the pieces, right? So I knew I had to have bolts hold this cross slide table somewhere in space. So that was going to be, there's going to be legs there, right? And I knew I needed to have uh, bolts to hold the bearings down. So there's going to be cross members right there. And you know, that's that also determined a little wiggle room in the placement of the bearing because I realized I could move the bearing to clear the table but also be in the same plane as the bolt holes in this leg. So that kind of constrained these together. Um, and then this leg was determined by this location of the bearing. And 
Then these pieces were determined by the location of the bolt holes for the motor adjustment. Um, and then I added additional frame members to provide rigidity uh, to the whole frame. So that that's a very simple uh, description of how to design this frame, but really you kind of place the parts where they need to be and then you sort of build the frame to hold them all. Um, and then the final couple parts that I ended up designing after the fact was these um, these guards, right? So there's a guard here. And I did, I did actually design these in CAD before I bent them to shape just because I wanted to see how things would clear and get the bend locations and stuff like that. But um, it was fairly dangerous when I fired this up for the first time. So yeah, I thought, thought it would be nice to add a guard here. And I, I didn't model the holes because I just drilled and, and bolted this at the end of, of the of the construction. Um, and then, you know, for fanciness, there's several bolt um, bolted connections here. And, you know, it's nice to be able to see that your washers will clear your frames and your welds and stuff like that and get a good bill of materials for the hardware you needed to get. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the whole design concept about how I went about putting this machine together. Uh, in a nutshell, you know, cad up all your parts that you that you have, uh, the things you purchased or the things that you are gonna use off the shelf, and then you know design the parts that you need in order to make all those fit together, and then you design your frame. And kind of connect it all together. Um, all right, so in the next video, we'll actually start building this thing, and I'll comment on all the different little parts along the way. So thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks everybody for watching. If you found this content helpful, please consider supporting Never Stop Building. The easiest way to do that is to simply hit that red subscribe button and click the bell to get notified of new videos and content that I release. If you really want to be my best buddy, become a Patreon subscriber where you can get plans to all these projects, uh, exclusive content, and much more. So check the description below for a link to that. And as always, never stop building.